guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. If I sound ill, it's because I am, so please excuse my voice. I know it sounds a bit gross, but I really wanted to get a video up for you guys this week, seeing as I missed last week. I know you guys like it when I cover the more obscure cases, but this week's case you may have heard of is quite a popular one. Um, but I really wanted to cover a case that was mostly written about in Spanish. Um, just because I wanted to practice my Spanish reading comprehension and I figured this would be a really good way to do it. And whilst I was researching cases that happened in Spanish speaking countries, this one just came up again and again. It's often billed as the Mexican equivalent to the John Bonnet Ramsey case and it's the case of Paulette Hibara Fura. Paulette was born on the 20th of July 2005 to her parents Mauricio Hibara and Lizette Fura. They had married four years earlier in 2001 and both of them came from pretty wealthy backgrounds. Lizette was born into quite a wealthy family and later became quite a successful lawyer herself and Mauricio was a successful businessman. The first child came along a couple of years after they got married, a daughter who they also named Lizette. Now for the purposes of this video I'm going to refer to her as Little Lizette because that's what I saw a lot of other publications refer to her as just to stop any confusion between Lizette and Lizette. A couple of years later Lizette became pregnant again but this time the pregnancy didn't go as smooth as the first one. Paulette was born on the 20th of July 2005 at just 25 weeks. She weighed one pound and seven ounces. And limitations were placed on Paulette from the day she was born. Her parents were told that she'd never walk, she'd never talk, she'd never be able to function properly. Of course Paulette did have physical disabilities and developmental delays but she always did better than people thought she would do. She would always push the goalpost just that little bit further. She eventually learned to walk with the aid of horse therapy and this sparked a love in her for horses. Now she could never walk unaided and she was never able to take more than a few steps but this was more than anybody ever thought she'd be able to do. As she did learn to be able to communicate in her own way, Paulette couldn't string together full sentences, but she could say the words that she needed to say to be understood. She could say things like mum, dad, water. She attended mainstream school, she was in kindergarten, where she obviously had teaching assistants, but she was in mainstream. She required a lot of trips to the doctors and the hospitals and different physical therapies as well. Paulette died in Mexico City on or around the 22nd of March 2010. Her death became the centre of a media storm. The entire country went absolutely crazy over what happened to Paulette. Even though officially Paulette's death was eventually ruled as an accident, a lot of people question whether her parents or her nannies had something to do with it. On Sunday the 21st of March, Mauricio, Little Lizette and Paulette return home to Okay, I don't even know how to begin to pronounce this word, so I'm going to put it here. And um, this is the area they lived in in Mexico City. So on Sunday, the 21st of March, around 9 pm, Mauricio and his two daughters return home from a weekend trip they've taken to Val de Bravo. Now, the mum, Lizette, had also been away for the weekend, but not with her family. She'd gone on a trip away with her friend Amanda to Los Cabos. Lizette arrived home around the same time as Mauricio and the girls. Lizette says she vividly remembers putting Paulette to bed that evening. She gave her a kiss and said she'd see her in the morning. And like I mentioned before, the family were pretty wealthy. They lived in a nice neighborhood in a secure apartment block and they had two live-in nannies who looked after Paulette and little Lizette. The nannies were sisters themselves, Erica and Martha Casimiro. The next morning on the 22nd of March, Erica and Martha get up little Lizette and get her ready for school. Little Lizette had to be at school first thing in the morning. She was seven years old. But Paulette had to go to school a little bit later, so they'd always get Little Lizette ready first. They walked Little Lizette to the bus stop and then headed back to the apartment to get Paulette up. However, when they went into her room, she wasn't there. Now, like I mentioned, the apartment block they lived in was expensive and high security. There were cameras everywhere and quite a lot of residents as well. And nobody saw anything strange go on that night. All the locks and the windows in the building were completely secure. So there's no way that anybody got into the building. And bear in mind that Paulette had a physical disability as well. She couldn't walk that far, especially unaided. So she couldn't have got up and walked out of the building herself. The nannies have a frantic look around the apartment. And when they realize that Paulette's just nowhere, 
they have to call Mauricio and Lizette at work to let them know and the two of them head back home. The nannies begin a proper search of the building, searching all the floors, all the little hiding places she could be, but of course she wasn't anywhere. They spoke with different neighbours, but like I said, nobody saw anything. Mauricio and Lizette come home, but they don't join in on the search effort. Whilst the nannies are frantically looking around the entire building, Lizette apparently just sits at the table with a cup of coffee and Mauricio just sort of wanders around the apartment occasionally checking inside different cupboards but they don't really panic at any point as most people would do if their disabled daughter had suddenly gone missing. It wasn't even the parents who called the police, it was Mauricio's sister. He calls her and tells her what's gone on that Paulette's missing and the sister obviously freaks out and calls the police but it's just very strange that neither of the parents did this. Now this case takes off big time and over the coming week the media really grab on to Paulette's story. So much so that on Thursday the 25th of March the Attorney General of the state, a man called Alberto Basbas, actually does a press conference himself and reveals a poster of Paulette to try and bring any attention to the case. Obviously the police come in and they start to search around the apartment but at no point are they looking for Paulette. They're just looking to see if there was any sign of forced entry and when they realise they weren't that was kind of it, they didn't make any effort into actually looking for the girl, they just made sure the windows weren't broken. Over the coming day, hundreds of police officers and detectives and forensic experts are in and out of the apartment and there was no crime scene ever made. People were just allowed to come and go as they pleased. Mauricio and Lizette go in front of the media themselves and Lizette makes a plea to whoever has her daughter just to let her go in a public place. There would be no consequences, they wouldn't try and search for this person, they just wanted their daughter home. They say that Paulette was the sweetest little angel, she never had tantrums, she never caused them any problems, she was just a really sweet little girl. By the end of that week, Paulette's face was absolutely everywhere. You couldn't turn on the TV without seeing her. She was on posters and public transport, there were billboards. She was absolutely everywhere. Nobody in Mexico didn't know about Paulette. Over that weekend as well, the Habaras had media crews inside their apartment. Lizette did interviews while sat on Paulette's bed, talking about how sweet Paulette was, showing them artwork she'd made, but she never seemed upset. She seemed nervous, but she didn't ever shed a tear on camera. At one point, Lizette sat on Paulette's bed with a pair of Paulette's pyjamas next to her. And then the case takes a massive turn. The Attorney General I mentioned before, Alberto Basbas, goes on TV in a press conference and announces that there are four suspects in the case. Mauricio, Lizette, and the two nannies, Erica and Martha. There's zero evidence of anybody breaking into the apartment and Paulette couldn't leave on her own, so it only makes sense that the only people who could know what happened to her are the four people who were in the apartment. He says on national TV, each one of them at a certain moment has falsified their statement, which has made it difficult to know the facts and to clarify a firm line of investigation. It became clear that the parents who had been acting like model parents on TV had been lying about a lot. They had gone publicly and said that they searched for Paulette themselves, but it came out that they hadn't. It was the nannies who had searched all along. On the 30th of March, the parents and the nannies were taken to a hotel where they were sequestered and they weren't allowed to leave. It was part of a restriction order that had been placed on them by the authorities. That same day, experts created a reconstruction of what could have happened to Paulette in the apartment. The family were now under a complete microscope. Every single thing they did was being analysed. However, the next morning at 2am, Paulette's body is found in a place that no one expected. They started to notice a strange smell in Paulette's room and so they searched and they found her in her bed. Or more specifically, they found her wedged at the end of her bed. Her bed was a bit of a strange one, it had been custom made for Paulette and honestly it wasn't suitable for a disabled child at all. It had been made to kind of look like a ship apparently, even though I failed to see the resemblance. But it had wooden poles at the footboard and what had happened is Paulette had somehow got herself wedged between the mattress and the wooden poles. Now you can actually find a video of them discovering Paulette's body on YouTube. I'm not going to insert it in here because it's pretty graphic. Um, I will link it down below if anybody's interested in going and watching that. But just be warned, it's not the nicest video to watch. So it turns out they were searching the room because I had this very strange smell. 
and they pull out some blankets from the end of the bed which were kind of covered it looks like blood it later turned out to probably be like decomposition fluid so when they found these blankets they called the coroner in and it was whilst the coroner was there that they carry on searching for Paulette and they eventually find her body and when they find her body the coroners actually stood there going they beat her they beat her, her his first reaction to finding the body was that she'd been beaten to death because it looked like blood on the blankets they never have fully confirmed what it actually was on the blankets but it's commonly thought that it was just sort of decomposition fluid you're probably wondering how something like this can happen how can paulette find herself wedged at the end of this bed um the nannies every night would put paulette's bed between two massive body pillows in case she fell out and these pillows were bigger than paulette was they were absolutely huge one on each side and paulette would sort of sleep wedged between the two again just another reason why the bed was crazy unsuitable for a girl with such severe disabilities they should have had something sort of proper made the conclusion was made that paulette had somehow managed to wriggle her way down the bed between these two pillows and found herself wedged between the mattress and the wooden poles at the end and she'd asphyxiated to death the autopsy said the death was accidental it was put down as mechanical asphyxia due to obstruction of the nasal cavities and thorax abdominal compression basically she'd suffocated against the mattress i couldn't find this particular fact anywhere but i'd be quite intrigued to know whether paulette regularly sort of moved around on her bed if the nannies were coming in the morning and find her in like different positions if she had sometimes just wriggled down to the end and um, for a girl who couldn't really move her legs that well it does seem a bit unlikely to me that Paulette would find herself all the way down there. It's not completely impossible, don't get me wrong, but I do find it a bit strange. The autopsy showed that Paulette had eaten at least five hours before her death, and it was unlikely that her body had been moved after her death. There were no signs of physical or sexual abuse or drugs in her system. So here I'm going to talk about the most obvious explanation, I suppose, that it was an accident, that the autopsy was correct, and Paulette just managed to wriggle her way down to the end of the bed. I'll get to some more controversial theories in a little bit don't worry now Paulette's bed was huge and Paulette was only four years old but she was smaller than your standard four-year-old because she had so many delays in her development like I said the nannies would put the two huge body pillows either side of her so she wouldn't fall out of bed but she also had many many blankets and cushions on the bed it would have been quite heavy on top of her and Paulette didn't have much body strength so it's not crazy to think that if she got herself in trouble she couldn't get out from underneath all the blankets a lot of people also argue that the reason nobody found Paulette's body for nine days even though her body was decomposing pretty badly was because of all the heavy blankets and they kept the smell in the autopsy showed that she had died five to nine days beforehand which makes sense with the dates however a lot of forensic experts refused to believe this there was one medical examiner who like point blank refused to sign the certificate saying she died nine days beforehand because he just didn't believe that she had there were urine stains on the mattress next to where she was found and she would have probably wet herself around the time that she died but obviously the big question is why did it take them so long for the body to be found it seems unlikely that there were so many people in and out of paulette's bedroom in those nine days and not a single person noticed this bulk at the end of the bed and this becomes even more shocking when i tell you that other people slept in the bed whilst paulette was gone one of lizette's good friends slept in the bed as well as an aunt and uncle possibly even more people than that but not a single person noticed this weird sort of lump at the end of the bed. And for me, this raises quite a few different questions. The first one is that so many people argue that it was the heavy blankets that kept in the smell of decomposition, but surely when people crawled into the bed, they would have lifted up the duvet and some of that smell would have escaped. They would have sort of thought, oh, that smells a little bit gross and maybe looked into it a little bit more. Or even if they weren't smelling the decomposition, there was a urine stain there, so surely they would have smelt the urine. Question number two is how did nobody feel this weird bulk at their feet? Just drawing from my own personal experience here, I sleep in a king size bed. My bed is absolutely massive and I'm pretty small, I'm five foot one, so I do not need a bed this big, I just like to be able to starfish. But my point is, if I have something at the end of my bed, if there's sort of clothes or something there, I can feel it there and it bugs me and I have to go and move it. So how do, I'm guessing full grown people, I say full grown, I'm talking about average sized people, not notice something like that in a double bed it also seems like the nannies would make the bed in a kind of hotel fashion they would sort of really tuck all the blankets in at the very end of the bed sort of like underneath the mattress seems a bit strange to me that not a single person got into the bed and tried to like pull the duvet or the sheets 
out from underneath the mattress. I know whenever I go to a hotel, that's like the first thing I do, you know, you have the battle with the sheets trying to like get them out from being so tight. Um, yeah, it just seems a bit strange to me that not a single one of them did that. I surely moved in the sheets, sort of let Paulette loose. And question number three, which hasn't got so much to do with the discovery of Paulette's body, but just Lizette in general and Mauricio, I suppose. Why would you feel comfortable letting people come over and stay in your missing child's bed? Surely you'd want to preserve her bedroom exactly how it is. I know people sort of have their kids go missing and they never ever touch their room. They don't let anybody go in. It sort of stays exactly how it is. It just seems very strange that Zer was so willing to let other people sleep in Paulette's bed. Not even thinking about the fact that it was a crime scene. Even if the police didn't sort of cordon it off as a crime scene themselves, Surely you'd use a bit of common sense and think, oh, maybe I shouldn't let other people sleep in Paulette's bed in case there's some kind of evidence I'm going to ruin there. And the nannies insist they checked the bed multiple times in the time that Paulette was missing. And they made it multiple times as well. After each time a person came and stayed over, they would remake the bed, obviously. Even after Paulette was found, the nannies did multiple reconstructions with the police showing them how they would make the bed. And there is a lot of sort of discussion over this. Some people say that the way that the nannies make the bed, they could have easily have missed Paulette's body there. But I personally struggle to see how they could have missed her body being there. Unless, of course, they were just slacking off a bit and weren't doing their jobs properly, in which case they must feel awful. But still, I struggle to see how nobody saw Paulette's body. Like, every time they would make the bed, they would lift up the corners of the mattress and tuck the sheets underneath. You'd think Paulette's body would sort of get loose or move a little bit. And like I said before, they weren't the only ones who were in and out of Paulette's bedroom constantly. There were hundreds of people in and out of the bedroom. And the entire crime scene was completely destroyed. If there was any evidence there, it was going to be rendered completely useless. I mean, they'd even let police go into Paulette's bathroom and use her toilet. Detectives claim they searched extensively, but obviously they weren't searching extensively enough if they missed Paulette's body every single time. Or maybe Paulette's body wasn't there the entire time anyway. After all, I find it very hard to believe that not a single person noticed the smell of a decomposing body. Tracker dogs were brought in and they never alerted to anything. Now there is a little bit of conversation over whether these tracker dogs were searching for a live body or a dead body. Um, a lot of people say they weren't actually cadaver dogs and therefore they wouldn't have picked up on Paulette's body being there. Um, apparently the dogs came in and they sort of smelt something off Paulette's and sort of hung around the room. They didn't go anywhere, they didn't search for anything. And this could just be because Paulette was in the room. But even if they were just using dogs looking for a live body in this, why would they not bring in cadaver dogs as well? That just makes sense and the police completely messed up. There's no doubt that the police didn't do their job as well as they should have in this case. I mean, they didn't even search for Paulette's body on the first day she went missing. They just made sure that the windows were locked. After Paulette's body was found, Attorney General Bass Bass announces Paulette's death to the public. But he also publicly says that Lizette Farah is still the number one suspect in the case, even though the death is ruled accidental. Obviously, it wasn't ruled an accident until quite a few days later, but still, Bas Bas goes on TV and says she is the only suspect. I have no doubt that this is a homicide investigation. At the moment, we can say that Lizette is a suspect. In addition to her, we are investigating the level of knowledge of others involved. On the 3rd of April, Lizette initiates a proceeding against the restriction order placed on her and she says that she has nothing to do with her daughter's death, she is completely innocent. And the next day she's actually granted freedom and her and Mauricio and Erica and Martha are all allowed to leave the hotel. But they were not allowed to leave the country until the investigation was over. Now there are many reasons why Bass Bass was so sure that Lizette was involved and to be honest, the rest of the country were sure that Lizette was involved as well. All of Mexico thought this mum had killed her daughter. And honestly, they did have their reasons. Lizette seemed completely unbothered by her daughter's disappearance. She would go on TV, she would seem nervous but not upset at any point, and she just didn't seem like a mother grieving for her lost child. Of course, everyone grieves differently and we can never judge somebody for how they act after the death or disappearance of a loved one, but people found something very suspicious in the way that Lizette was acting. Lizette also made a lot of very strange and to be honest, inappropriate comments about her daughter's disappearance. At one point she's caught on TV saying, maybe Paulette was taken by aliens or by Harry Potter. And she says as well, even if I lose Paulette, I still have another daughter. Very strange comments from a grieving mother. And there was also a recording between Lizette and her daughter, little Lizette. And in this recording, Lizette is heard saying to her daughter, like, you cannot say anything to the media about Paulette. 
Otherwise, people will think that we're guilty. Actually, no, to be honest, she's not even just saying, like, we'll be found guilty. She's saying you will be found guilty to her seven-year-old daughter, placing the blame, kind of, on her. She says, because otherwise, they will blame us for stealing her or say that you took her away to be stolen. Now this conversation was recorded by Bugs in the apartment and at first Lizette completely denied saying this and then eventually she conceded and said that she did say it but it was taken in the complete wrong context. And then there's the issue of Paulette's pyjamas. You know, earlier I mentioned that Lizette did an interview sat on Paulette's bed with a pair of her pyjamas next to her. These pyjamas were kind of a blue top and reindeer printed dark pyjama bottoms. Now these were on the bed whilst Lizette was talking to the media, but these were also the pyjamas that Paulette was wearing when she was found. And a lot of people place so much weight on these pyjamas. I personally am inclined to believe it's not really anything that suspicious. She probably just owned two pairs of the same pyjamas. It's really not that crazy. I mean, maybe one pair were little Lizette's and one pair were Paulette's and they both sort of ended up in Paulette's room. I think too much weight is placed on this tiny little detail, but I do wonder why the family have never addressed this in public, or maybe they have and I've just sort of lost it in translation. But you would think that maybe Lizette or Mauricio would come forward and be like, oh no, we did have two pairs of the same pyjamas, and that would be that entire suspicion over and done with, but from what I can gather, nobody's ever really said anything about it. Attorney Baspas said publicly that Lizette suffered with a personality disorder. He actually got her seen by the state psychiatrist, a woman called Sandra y Yadome? Yadome? I'm sorry, that's probably completely wrong. I never gave any like specific diagnosis as to what sort of personality disorder Lizette had, he just said publicly that she had a personality disorder. Psychiatrist Sandra said that Lizette was very intelligent, very capable and very astute. She made a very good lawyer and she was smart, but she was cold and unemotional and she really lacked empathy. Alongside all of this other incriminating evidence, there's also multiple rumours that Lizette was never in Los Cabos with her friend Amanda at all and that she was actually having an affair. So she'd spent the previous three days with a man she was having an affair with. Now both Lizette and the man have completely denied this. Now Paz Paz remains certain that Lizette is the one who killed her daughter and it does seem a little bit unusual to me how he's saying all this in the media. Maybe that's just something that happens quite a lot in Mexico. In the UK that isn't really something that happens. You don't go publicly and say like yes this person killed this person. I mean it's innocent until proven guilty right? But because of Baspaz's comments everybody in Mexico became convinced that Lizette is the one who killed her daughter and still to this day many many people think that this is the case but it does seem like a kind of witch hunt. But it later came out that Bas Bas was actually very, very close with the Hibara family. He was really good friends with Mauricio. There's been a lot of speculation over the years that Mauricio actually convinced Bas Bas to say all of this about his wife, to publicly incriminate her, to maybe either take the heat off him, or maybe because he wanted to punish his wife, maybe for her grating personality or an affair. The two of them were actually having very bad financial difficulties as well. Even though they had a very nice house in a very nice area, they were struggling to keep up with the payments and they just couldn't do it anymore. On top of all of Paulette's medical bills, paying for the nannies, the hospital, the doctors, the therapy, it really added up and the two of them were in severe financial difficulty. Bizarrely, on April 5th, both Mauricio and Lizette go in front of the press in separate interviews and blame the other for Paulette's death. It just seems completely unprecedented. A lot of these cases where kids go missing or they die, the parents really try to keep on a united front, but Mauricio and Lizette just didn't seem worried about this. Lizette said that she feels like her husband is unfairly blaming her for all of this and she doesn't know why. And Mauricio went in front of the press and said, well, I know 100% that I'm innocent in this, but I don't know about my wife. I do have to wonder if Mauricio planned all of this himself and used his connection to the Attorney General to vilify his wife. I mean, the marriage fell apart very, very quickly after Paulette's disappearance. I mean, even if they were having marriage problems beforehand, it just seems crazy that they would go so publicly and say that they just don't like each other and trust each other. Was he maybe campaigning against Lizette so hard to cover something else up? On April 6th, Paulette's funeral was held in Mexico City and Lizette obviously headed up the funeral herself but none of the Havara family, her husband's family, were allowed to attend after an agreement between them. I don't know the details of this agreement, but I do find it very, very strange that 
his entire side of the family were not allowed to attend. Now the Habara family have actually been looking after little Lizette for the last few days since the 4th of April and Lizette goes to the family and says like I want to see my daughter can I have her and they refuse. They say nope you're not allowed to have her. It takes Lizette a month but on the 10th of May she finally gets custody granted back to her. On the 26th of May, Attorney General Bas Bas actually resigns from his position. He says that he believes he did everything right in the investigation, he has no regrets and he still believes that Lizette is suspicious, but he resigns anyway. So I've already sort of touched on a couple of different theories. First of all, I spoke about how it could have been an accident and I mentioned some of Mauricio and Lizette's problems, but now we're going to get really deep into it. Let's have a look at the nannies. Now, I personally don't believe that the nannies had anything to do with this whatsoever. If they did, it really just wouldn't make any sense at all. The nannies had been employed with the family for seven years. It was a very, very good job for them. They were paid well. They managed to stay together as sisters and they just were living a pretty good life. I mean, they lived in this very nice apartment. They were getting paid well and they really both enjoyed their jobs. They were helpful and honest with the authorities throughout, or at least as far as we know. And after Paulette's death was actually ruled as an accident, they begged the authorities to reopen it and look into it again. This just doesn't seem like people who are guilty. If they were guilty and they did this, why would they ask them to reopen it after it was ruled an accident? They completely insist that Paulette's body wasn't there and that it wasn't at the end of the bed and that they would have found her. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the nannies. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I just don't think there's any evidence whatsoever to point to it being them. They'd have no reason to do it. One of the most prevailing theories in this is that the parents did it for financial gain. Mauricio and Lizette killed Paulette together, but they probably didn't mean to kill her. Like I said, they were both having severe financial troubles and they were both from wealthy families. Maybe they thought if they staged a kidnapping, people would give them money and this would get them out of the bind they're in with Paulette's care. They probably justified it to themselves by saying, well, the reason we're in financial trouble is Paulette and all of her disabilities and all of the care she needs. So we'll just do this and we'll pretend that she was taken and we'll get that money and we'll use it to make her life better or get us out of this financial trouble. But Paulette required a lot of care and they would have had to have stored her somewhere in the building. They didn't take her out of the building at any point the cameras would have seen. So Paulette probably was in the building if this was the case. A lot of people suspect that she could have been kept in an air duct or maybe in the lift shaft. A lot of residents in the building say that in the days after Paulette disappeared, there was this weird bump in the lift. As it was going down, there would always just be this jolt. And a lot of people suspect that Paulette's body, or Paulette alive, was kept in this lift shaft. But Paulette did require around the clock care, and if she was kept in a confined space, and the parents didn't realise there was going to be so much media attention, and they couldn't go back and get her without incriminating themselves, she possibly just suffocated to death. Maybe they put a gag in her mouth to stop her calling out. Paulette didn't have many words in her vocabulary, but she was vocal, she could make a noise. So a gag would probably make sense for them here. When they went back to retrieve her, they found her dead and they panicked, didn't know what to do. And so just placed her at the end of the bed. If Lizette did have this personality disorder, it's very likely that she didn't feel much guilt over doing this to Paulette. They're probably justifying the ends with the means, saying if we do this, we can afford to pay for her care and it's all for her own good, really. But what doesn't make sense if this is the case is why the two of them turn on each other so suddenly, so quickly, after all of the media attention. If they'd done this together, they'd want to keep a united front, but instead they're just blaming each other, he said, she said, and it puts a lot more attention on them than they probably wanted. Another theory is that Lizette did kill her, but on purpose. Lizette didn't like having a disabled daughter, she didn't like having to give her all that care, and so in cold blood, she just killed her daughter and then covered it up by placing her body at the end of the bed. I mean, at the end of the day, she was caught saying that if Paulette dies, then she has another daughter and it doesn't matter anyway. What kind of parent would say something like that? She lacked empathy and found her daughter to be a chore and she just didn't love her. And this is the general consensus across Mexico. This is what most people think. Again, if this is the case, then Lizette would have had to have stored Paulette's body for a few days before she could move it without being seen. And again, this could be the bump in the lift shaft or in an air duct. Another big theory here, which very much links it to the John Bonnet Ramsey case again, is that little Lizette actually is the one who killed her sister. Probably accidentally, maybe Mauricio and Lizette were arguing and little Lizette goes into Paulette's bedroom to kind of calm her or like keep her company for a bit. 
and trying to quiet her down accidentally suffocates her. I don't know really how much I believe this theory. I mean, a lot of people hold on to it because of what Lizette said to her daughter about people blaming her. I suppose it is possible, but I just don't really see how a seven-year-old girl could kill a four-year-old and it never really come out. I mean, she was a child. She probably would have said to somebody, accidentally let it slip or been upset about it at some point. Now little Lizette is actually a teenager, it'll be very interesting to see if she ever says anything about her sister's death in the coming years. Honestly, I don't know what to believe in this case. I don't think it's completely impossible that Paulette did suffocate in bed by wriggling down to the end of the bed. It makes sense, but what doesn't make sense is how nobody discovered the body for nine whole days. I've never personally smelt death myself, but I know people who have, and they say that it's unlike anything else, and it's not a subtle smell. You can smell it a mile off, and nine days on, it would have been absolutely horrific. I do not believe that a few blankets could have covered up that smell. Also seems impossible because whilst the nannies made the bed they would lift up the mattress and they surely would have felt the extra weight for one but also Paulette's body must have shifted at some point and it just never showed itself. I personally think that Mauricio knows something, something more than he's letting on. I think he used his connections with Attorney General Bas Bas to possibly frame his wife in some way. Um, maybe he knows that his wife did it and that's the reason he's framing her because she is guilty. Or maybe he does know something. Then again, all of the weird comments that Lizette made, I don't think it was completely crazy to think that she could have killed her daughter. I don't know, I mean, she was smart, she was a lawyer, but I find it really hard to believe that, that she didn't leave some kind of evidence. But then again, the police destroyed the crime scene, so maybe there was evidence and they just never found it. I cannot tell you what I think in this case. Now, weirdly enough, on the 3rd of May 2017, so just last year, Paulette's remains were exhumed and she was cremated. And this is very, very strange because it just doesn't seem like there was a reason for them to do this. They say it was because Paulette's case is now closed, there's no more investigation, she's no longer evidence in this case, but it just seems like an extra painful step for the family to exhume her body and cremate her. I would be very intrigued to know if there's any particular person who was the driving force behind this happening. I think that if maybe Lizette pushed for it to happen or Mauricio pushed for it to happen, that maybe they could be looked into a little bit more, but now the main piece of evidence, Paulette's body, is gone. I can't wait to hear what all of you guys think about this case. Do you think it was an accident or do you think it was one of the parents? What do you think the motive behind it was? I read all of my comments in every single video, so I can't wait to see what you guys think. Also, quickly before I end this video, I just want to say that I still have pins up for sale. I released a load of pins last week. The true crime pin, the little red heart, has completely sold out. I have no more of them left. But I do have quite a few of the spooky pins and the cute skull pins. So if you want to buy them, it'll be in the first link down below. Um, you'll be supporting my channel by doing so. Any money that I make from these pins, it's going straight back into my channel. New equipment, microphone lighting vlog camera really desperately need new vlog camera because mine is completely broken so yeah you'll be supporting my channel by doing so um so thank you i suppose if you already bought a pin and thank you if you're gonna buy one and i will see you in my next video bye guys